Okay. Um, so today we will do the uh, exam review. Um, and I kind of, I posted this deck under module two, um, as well as the Excel file that I'm going to use to demonstrate some of the, um, some of the questions here. Um, but before we start, I want to kind of um, mention a couple things. Um, first, um, so the exam will be available starting from, and there is an announcement about this, so you guys can go and check it. Um, the exam is going to start 6 p.m. next Wednesday, and it's going to end at 11 p.m. Uh, Saturday. Uh, and the, the reason that we have this um, duration, you guys probably familiar, there is going to be a proctoring. You can do proctor free, or you can do, you know, go to a proctor center and then do it. Um, and the, the exam time is like two and a half hours. And during that time, basically, uh, you know, you have some number of questions and then you will start kind of tackling them. Um, this is a closed book exam and you don't need any software as well. So you don't need Excel, you don't need SAS or anything. Um, so it is gonna be more about interpreting the results and then doing the computations if you can do by hand. And I'll show you examples of what I meant, what I mean by that. Um, and then you can you can have one cheat sheet, both sides like an A, you know, like um, the regular white paper, like A4 paper, uh, back and forth. You know, you can kind of put some points for yourself uh, to use during the exam. Uh, pen, pencil, empty papers is okay too. Scratch papers if you want to do computation, as well as the calculator. Um, so th these are all kind of uh, allowed, you know, like during the exam, uh, but you will not need any, you know, like kind of Excel, any no stats tool needed or any of the software for this exam. Um, but, uh, and then it is closed book again, just A4 paper, both sides you can fill, and a calculator. That's okay too. Um, do you guys have any questions? And then a proctoring specific, oh. uh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry, no questions, go ahead. No, no I was gonna say proctoring specific stuff. Uh, Dr. Adewar is gonna help with that. Um, so any question about the technology for the proctoring, you know, like this proctor free and those type of questions, you can direct to her. So yeah, that was one. What is the question? So are the, are the questions would be more, uh, Theoretical, or are there going to be more? Uh, there would be calculations involved. There will be calculations, and I will show you examples. So actually, the the topic of this uh, ex, you know today's session will be on what typical what are the topics that is going to be covered in the exam, uh, plus also what are the example questions that represents the type of questions that you will get in the exam. So we we will cover that basically. Okay. Thanks. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Okay, if you have a question, you can also interrupt me during the session. Uh, so I'll kind of start, and again, this slide deck that I'm showing is already published. So you guys actually can see, you know, like, and this deck basically has example questions uh, that are similar to what you will be seeing in the test. Uh, so you can also kind of follow it yourself as well. Okay, so these are the topics that will be covered in the exam. And, uh, and this, these are mostly driven by homework and CCPs. Um, so for forecasting, regression, moving average, uh, simple exponential smoothing, and then the concepts around the forecasting error, like the residuals, um, different types of errors, you know, like there is the, um, and I will let you go through, I copy pasted the slide from the forecasting deck uh, like the MAPE, you know, like mean absolute percent error. Um, so all of those basically will be, uh, you know, like that's part of the exam topics. Um, this is for the forecasting. This is module one. And for module two, um, you're going to be asked questions from modeling, like a problem statement is going to be given. Sorry, there's a, let me check to see if it is. Okay, I don't see the chat. Is there any issue? Okay. Okay, got it. So it's gonna be uh, the question format Amanda is asking about. Um, it's gonna be like a, a specific question is gonna be asked. Either it's gonna be a multiple choice and you're you gonna select, 
or it's going to be um, you need to kind of enter the you know similar to CCP basically. It's not a paragraph, so you will not have paragraph questions. Okay. And and actually, you know, like and the rest of the uh, section, you will see that uh, the type of questions and text is going to give you a more concrete idea. Um, okay, so optimization, the things that we are gonna, um, you know, like uh, the test will include are modeling. Modeling means that, you know, like you have it in your homework, uh, statements are gonna given to you. And then from there, like mathematical modeling, which is like, what is the objective function? What are the decision variables? What are the constraints? Um, these are gonna be the type of stuff that you will see. And I'll show you an example later. Also, um, you'll be tested on understanding of the solution. Uh, such as what's the feasible region, you know, like binding constraints, slacks, uh, those type of, you know, related to optimal solution, um, what are those things? And again, you will see an example later. And then the graphical representation, and you have one homework question like this. I think it was a second, second question uh, that is asking you solving the problem graphically. So similar to that one. Um, so there will be questions around that. And then the last uh, is the sensitivity analysis, like shadow, dual price, reduced cost, allowable range. And again, your homework, actually you have examples of this type of questions. And I will show you example of how you are gonna, um, you know, what type of questions you should expect. Any question on this uh, list of topics? So graph will be given to us and would be the questions we know on, yeah. the, on the graph. Nice, that's right. And I'll show you an example. Um, so all of these things, a graph is going to give them to you. And from that graph, uh, you will be asked to, um, you know, answer some of these questions. And one of the, the examples that I'm going to walk you through is like, it's going to ask about the optimist, optimal solution, I think. Um, and you looking at the graph, basically, we will find out where the optimal solution is. Yeah. Any other? Okay, cool. So I'm going to kind of go one by one and all of these actually I'm covering uh, all of these things like uh, typical questions. Okay, so the first question is about the regression and this is actually from your CCP one. Uh, like basically because we don't use software. So the purpose of this exam is not testing your software skills, but it is more like understanding, you know, understanding of the regression, understanding of the forecast. Uh, so because of this, you know, you will not need you will you will not be given a problem that you need to do lots of computation. Um, so, for example, in this question, um, the regression line is given, right? Okay. I am sorry. Hold on one second. Okay. Uh, here, in this uh, example, the regression line is given, uh, and from this, basically you are asked to uh, compute what will be the value of this estimation in week 20. Uh, and and it regression line, basically, the number of guests equal to 264 plus the slope multiplied with time. And here, time is 20. Um, so the, to answer this question, you guys basically write, uh, just replace T with 20, and then just do this calculation. Um, so basically, whatever the question in regression, you know, the, the line will be given. You will not be computing the line because you need a software to do that. Um, but you will basically be tested whether you understand what it means, you know, what that line means, and how do you compute the estimations for uh, different X values or T values. Any questions? Okay, so I'll jump to the forecasting. So forecasting, um, one of the topics that will be covered is the simple exponential smoothing and you have a homework problem. Uh, so basically in simple exponential smoothing, I just wanna review a little bit what it was and then I'll kind of walk you through an example. Um, and, and I think example is actually from CCP as well. Okay. And you should expect typical you know, a question like that. Um, so basically, in exponential smoothing, we have a smoothing constant. That smoothing constant, um, you know, like multi we multiplied it with the actual data point, um, and uh, it's a number between zero and one. Basically, in exponential smoothing, you need to compute two things. One of them is the level, the other one is the forecast. 
And here level at a time period is computed as smoothing constant multiplied with the actual data point plus one minus smoothing factor multiplied with the level from the previous period. So this is basically for the first thing to do in simple exponential smoothing is just compute the levels. So basically each time period, you need to have a, uh, you, you need to have a level. Um, the assumption that you can always, you know, for this exam, you can assume that um, for the first data point, level is same as the actual data point. And I'll show you an example of what I mean, because for the first data point, right, you don't have this, um, the level from the previous time period, because there is no previous time period. So basically the assumption here is that the previous time period level is same as the actual data point. And then uh, when you are computing the forecasting error or uh, when you are looking at the forecast, what you do is basically you take the level from a time period and then um, assign it as the forecast of the next period. But let me to walk you through the CCP question and I think it will make more sense. And this Excel file is also published, so you guys can actually uh, have a look at that. Okay. So this is uh, coming from our um, CCP. So what is given to you in CCP is this part, which is like the actual data points. So I'm gonna kind of uh, color it green. So this will be given to you. So basically, first time interval, actual 15, second time interval, actual seven, whatever it is, like it can maybe sales, I don't know, you know like it can be anything, right? Um, and then the question is, what is the forecast for the future periods that we don't have actual like this, right? And then, then also, I think it will be helpful to start thinking about the residuals and the error, although this question doesn't ask for it. So basically, in this question, you are given data for the two-week period, and then you are asked to forecast the number of deliveries in the first day of the uh, week three. And, the, and they, you are also given the smoothing constant, which is 0.4. So again, to repeat, this question, you are given the actual data points, and actual data points actually are the deliveries. So basically, in the first time period, or week one, um, 15 deliveries. In week two, 27 deliveries. So this actually happened. And then what, is, what it is asking is like, what is the uh, number of deliveries in the first day of week three? So this is two weeks, right? Which means that we have 14 days of data, and 15, time interval 15 becomes the first day of week three, so we need to kind of forecast for that. Um, and and it, as I said, you know, the first step in exponential smoothing is computing the level, okay? And then level is gonna determine the forecast. So here, this is the, okay, so, so the, here, as, as I said before, if you don't give on the level, the forecast for T minus one, uh, then you can assume that uh, level is same as the first data point. So here, basically, this is that, right? So again, the first thing to do is like the level of the first time period is same as the actual data point. Okay, so this is level. And then the goal here is to compute the forecast of time 15, which is the day 15, first day of the third week, and forecasting the deliveries for that. So once we set the level for the first time interval, then the next thing is like computing the level for the second time interval. And this is the formula. Uh, and this is similar to what I showed you before. So basically, you take the actual data point, which is seven, like B3, multiply by the smoothing factor, which is 0 0.4, plus one minus the alpha, right? And then multiply with the um, level from the previous period, which is 15. Okay, uh, so basically then you do the same computation for each time interval. And out of that, um, you have uh, basically the, the level until the end of day 14. So this is the first step. So after we set the first, the level of the first day, which is 15, same as the actual data point, then we compute the level for all the days. Then the forecast is basically, forecast of a time interval is the level from the previous time interval. Okay, so basically, if you wanna compute the forecast for time day two, which is here, it's actually the level from day one. Because the logic is, if you wanna forecast feature, you can only use the past data. 
right? So basically, if we want to have a forecast for day two, then we can only use day one, right? If we want to use, if we want to come up with the forecast for day three, then we can use both day one and day two. So basically, after we compute the level, then the forecast for each time interval becomes the forecast from the time interval, uh, the level from the time interval before, and it is like this basically. Okay, and now we have actually the forecast for each time interval. And if you want to compute the forecast for a missing, um, you know, like first day that we don't have the actuals, then we just need to get the level from the last day that we have the data, and that's the forecast. So for this problem, basically, the forecast is 22.08. Okay, so if this CCP question, the answer is basically 22.08. And, and the level? There's no level, right? Because for level, you need the actual data point. So basically, once you don't have actual data point, there is no concept of level. Um, level is only defined, as you remember, the formula for level is like the actual data point multiplied by the alpha plus one minus alpha multiplied by the level from the previous time period. Um, once you don't have any actuals, there's no concept of level, and the forecast for any time interval after that is the level of the last time interval that you forecast. Like here, the last day we forecast is this one, right? Last day that we compute the level is like 22.08, which means that the forecast for all the time interval here is same level. Because in simple exponential smoothing, actually the idea is like a constant, there's no trend or anything. It's like a constant stable um, number. Does it make sense? Yes. So uh, yeah, the thing is um, you will be given, you need to do hand calculation. I'm not going to give you like 15 data points compute like that. So you will be given less number of data points, but you need to do hand calculation. So this is why you need actually calculator. So because uh, the, the issue is Excel or those softwares doesn't seem to be available on all computers. Um, so we have an actually issue using softwares. Okay, but then, um, so, but, but to, I, uh, the, the, the logic is basically for you to understand what's going on here, not for you to compute like 15, 20, 30 numbers. So because of this, you are not going to be given an example like this, which requires, you know, like almost like an Excel, right? Because 15 is too many. And, um, you know, you'll be given less number of data points, but you need to calculate the level, understand the logic basically, how to compute these numbers. Cool. Is there any question? Um, and then one thing I want to introduce is residual. So once we come up with the forecast, then we can actually compute the residual or error, right? The CCP question is not asking for this. And I think the, the reason I'm kind of getting into this, this is a good gateway to the next question. Um, so also, you know, like make sure that you understand the concept of error. Error is basically actual minus the forecast. Okay, and you can, it is kind of interchangeable, residual or error, both of them actually can be used. One possible thing that you may be asked, right, um, which alpha value gives a better uh, forecast? Then you may need to, you know, like do the exponential smoothing calculation, maybe two times, if for example, if you wanna do alpha uh, 0.3 as well, right? We, then at that point, basically, we need to compute, sorry, we need to compute res, uh, level and forecast again and residual again, right? So basically, each different alpha value is going to require us to form the level and uh, forecast again. So this is going to be level for alpha 0 0.04, right? I'm just kind of tagging down so that it's easy. So 
So basically, uh, make sure that you understand kind of running this thing with different alphas. Uh, because, you know, like one of the things that happens in forecasting is finding the right alpha value, right? Um, and that was actually one of your homework questions, uh, optimizing the alpha. Uh, so that can be a possible uh, variation for exponential smoothing. And if you want to compute this, right? So basically, I need exactly the same set of things. Okay, I'm gonna make it a little smaller. This looks very big. Okay, but this time, instead of 0 0.4, we are gonna do 0 0.3. Okay, so let, let's kind of do it together. So um, as I said, the first for the first time in terms of like day one, the assumption is that the level is gonna be same as the actual. So I'm gonna just say that um, basically the level for day one is same as 15, right? And then now the level for other days is gonna change a little bit. So it's gonna be the actual data point, which is seven, multiply with the alpha plus one minus alpha, multiply by the level from the previous time period, which is this, okay? So because this is a formula and I'm gonna kind of fix the alpha because I'm gonna kind of drag it down. So basically, now each data point tells us the level, but this time with 0 0.3 smoothing factor. And you can see that levels are different now. Like this was the level from alpha 0 0.4, this is the level from alpha 0 0.3, and they are different. Now we will do the forecast. As I said, forecast was uh, the level from the previous time period. Okay, because again, for the first day, right, we don't have level from previous time period, we will assume that it is same as the level from this time period. And then for the rest, basically the forecast for day two will be the level from day one. The forecast for day three will be the level from day two. And basically it, is, it kind of carries on like that. And then if we are interested in the forecast for the first day, day 15, first day of the third week, then it is 22.06, okay? And then from this, we can compute the residual, which is actual, which is here, minus forecast, right? And I'm gonna just expand this. Now, you know, like, if we wanna understand, and you, you guys see that why I delete these numbers, right? Because the residual and error concept only exists if you have the actual data points, if you don't have actual data points, then there is no concept of a residual or an error because we don't know what's the actual thing. So because of this, I'm just deleting because I know that this error numbers that we see is invalid. Okay, so now I have two forecasting models. One of them is exponential smoothing with alpha 0.4. The other one is exponential smoothing, but this time alpha 0.3. Now the question is, which one is better? And for that, uh, we need to look at the residuals here and there, okay? But then you may, you may think, okay, this is like so many numbers to compare against each other, right? How are we gonna combine this? How are we gonna decide basically using these 14 numbers, which one is better? So for that, basically, we will introduce the um, forecast accuracy. And that's actually, I, I kind of, I copied past, uh, I put actually a slide from, um, our uh, forecasting deck, which is this one, okay? So basically, when you run variations of a forecasting model, and you wanna decide which parameter to pick or which method to pick, one thing, one thing you can do actually, you can look at these measures of accuracy and pick one and use that. So the first one is mean absolute error. So mean absolute error basically looks at each data point and take the absolute value of the error and sum them and divide by the number of data points, okay? Um, and let's kind of compute that actually. Okay, so basically what we wanna do is we wanna compute mean absolute error for two different models, okay?
Okay. So basically, to compute mean absolute error, we need to look at the errors. Okay, error column for the first model is here. So what I am going to do is actually I'm going to sum all the absolute value of these errors and divide by 14, which is the number of data points. Okay, so basically we can do sum. Oh, this doesn't work. Okay, let's do this. I think it will be easier. Absolute error. Okay, so now we created a column with absolute error. And I'll do the same thing here for the other model. Okay, so for our mean absolute error calculation, we are going to use these columns. Okay, basically what we did, we forecasted for each day and then compute the error, which is the actual minus the forecast, then take the absolute value. And that, so now it is mean absolute error, right? We just need to compute the mean, I think average. Okay, we need to, you know, that you can use them interchangeably, average for this. And I need to do the same thing here. Okay, so if you compare these two, basically the first model, which has the smoothing factor 0 0.4, has the error of 5.11. The second one has the error of 5.03. So if you compare these two, this is a better model, basically. Okay, so we will pick this one. So basically, if you are asked, which alpha gives you a better forecast? Is it 0 0.4 or 0 0.3? Uh, then the answer is 0 0.3 if you look at the mean absolute error. Okay, uh, so this is kind of one way to solve the problem. Let's go through the second accuracy metric as well. I think this will give you a good exposure. The second one is root mean square error. And most of the time, actually, these things actually give similar results. So I don't think it's going to change as much. Uh, but still, sometimes there is variation. So the second one we want to look at is root mean square error. So root mean square error, let's look at the formulation. The formulation here is you look at each error and residual, take a square, and then sum them, and then take an average of that then take the square root. So basically, if I repeat again, so for each day of forecast, basically, we have a residual or an error, right? So E here, ET, represents that. We take square of that and then sum it, right? And then take an average, then take the square root. So one of the things I would suggest, since this is gonna be one of the areas, and sometimes it is hard to remember these things, I would recommend actually for your cheat sheet, this may be one thing that you may wanna put, basically how to compute this, each of these accuracy measures. Um, I think because, you know, like you don't need to remember the formula, right? I mean, if you have it, then you can just check from there. So that would be one of my recommendations, but let's compute, right? Right now, a root mean square error. So for root mean square error, what we need is like square root of, uh, square of every error uh, given, right, uh, compared to the forecast, and then um, taking an average of that, then taking a square root. Okay, there's a square root function, so we can use this one. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do some product uh, over itself, it's gonna give us the square. So if I sum product, it, you know, like on itself, then it's gonna be the square for each term, and it's gonna sum. And then we want to take an average of that. I don't know if that average is going to work. Okay, so let's just divide by 14 because we have 14 data points. Okay, so this is the formula. Basically, we take the square root, square of each data point, divide by 14, then take square root. Okay, now we are going to do the same thing here. 
Okay, so you can see now we computed root mean square error. And again, with this respect to this measure, same thing again, alpha 0 0.3 is a better model because the root mean square error is smaller. So smaller the error, the better it is. So here we are seeing that the forecast model with alpha 0 0.3 actually has lower error than alpha 0 0.4. Um, and then let's kind of go through the last one uh, I think for the completeness, you know, like the last error measure is mean absolute percent error. I'm going to just mean absolute percent error. Actually, I know the names sound complicated, but if you think about it, you know, like basically it's the mean, it's the percent error, an absolute value of that, and the mean over that, right? Um, so, to, uh, so just to kind of make it clear, right? Um, you don't need to compute all of these measures. You can actually pick one, or maybe in the question, you will be asked to use one. And then that may be the one that you are gonna use. I'm just um, doing all of these calculations so to give you visibility in computing each of them. Usually, uh, it's, you know, you pick one method or one accuracy measure, one of these, and then compute that, or in the question, it will be given to you. And yeah, in the question, it will be given to you. You will be asked to say, use mean absolute error um, to decide which forecasting model is better. Or use root mean square error to decide which forecasting model is better. So I am computing all of them just to demonstrate how they are computed. But you don't need to compute. All. You will not need to compute all. You will be asked to use one of them. OK, let's do the mean absolute error. So mean absolute error basically um, but error percent. So we need actually the percent error. Okay. So I'm gonna create another. Okay, so we we will we will need absolute percent error. Okay. So absolute percent error is basically absolute error divided by the actual data point, okay? So basically, let's do this. Uh, the error, absolute error for day two is eight, and we need to divide it by seven, which is the actual data point. And it becomes, this is 100% error, right? Uh, more than 100%. So then we kind of uh, drag this. Okay, so then you, for each day, now we have absolute percent error, okay? And we will do the same thing actually for the other, you know, like the, the other model, which is the oh, this is gonna be wrong. Okay, let's kind of do this one. So this one is gonna be the absolute error divided by the actual data point. And actual data point is in B column, so I'm just dividing by that. Uh, I'm gonna make it actually a little bit smaller so that you guys can see all. And then we track this, okay? So now this column, column L, tells us the absolute percent error and we need mean value for that. So we just need to take an average basically of this. Okay, and then we will do the same here. Okay, you can see that with respect to all these measures, the best model is when alpha is 0 0.3. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of summarize what we did here. So um, some data points are given to us, and we are asked to um, compute the forecast for alpha equal to 0 0.4, right? That's the first question. And then the second part is I kind of expanded the question to show you how to use different error accuracy, me different measures of accuracy for forecasting to decide how to pick the best alpha. For the forecasting, for the first day of the uh, third week, which is day 15, basically what we did, we did a couple of things. First thing we did is like um, for day one, because we don't have the previous time periods, the, we assume that the level is same as the actual data point. So basically level for day one is 15 because the actual data point is 15. And then for the rest of it, basically, we um, take the actual, multiply by alpha plus, one minus alpha multiplied with the level from the previous time period. Let me show you here, for example, this one. So this one basically tells us 
level uh, from the previous time period, which is 15, multiplied by one minus alpha, plus actual data point, which is seven, multiplied by alpha. So this way, we can compute basically level for each day. Okay, so that's the second step. So the first step, we did the assumption, uh, we made the assumption that um, the level of day one is same as the actual data point. Second thing we did is compute the levels for each data, uh, for each day. Then the third thing is like the forecasting, right? Forecasting is basically um, looking at the levels from the time period before. So for example, here the level is the, uh, sorry, the forecast is the level from day one. Here, which is day three, uh, the forecast is the level from day two. Okay, so you basically compute the forecast for each. Uh, but again, we have an assumption, right? Because we don't have level from the previous time period for the first time interval, which is day one. We assume again, it's same as the actual. So basically for day one or the first time period, your level, your forecast is same as the actual data point here. You can see these three numbers here. Okay, and then you compute that basically. Uh, so then now you have your forecast. The second thing to do is like computing your residuals. Your, the residual is basically actual minus the forecast or residual or error, you know, you, you, both terms can be used. And it is basically take the um, actual, which is 15, uh, forecast 15, and then just subtract them. And then do the same thing here. Uh, take the actual, which is seven, forecast 15, and subtract them. And each of them give you residuals. After we compute residuals, we kind of went through three measures of accuracy, right? And then we compute um, which model is better. Is it alpha 0 0.3 or alpha 0 0.4? And it turned out all of these measures tells us that alpha 0 0.3 is a better model. So then if we have the option of picking a forecast model among these two, we should pick the one here. That's the conclusion. Another conclusion is the forecast for day one of the first third week or day 15, it's the same thing, right? Day one of the third week or day 15, it's the level from the last day that we have the actuals, which is here. So basically the forecast for the time periods that you don't have any actual data is same as the level of the last time period that you have the data. So this kind of concludes the simple exponential simulating. Any questions on this? So uh, would, will there be a question of uh, which alpha to go for or alpha is given to us? So no, you like, alpha. like in this, you started with 0.4, but then you went down to 0.3. You could have gone up to 0.5 and then found out that uh, uh, 0.4 was the better alpha. Okay, great question. I, so because exam, you don't have so much time, you, the alphas given will be given to you. So basically you will be, a typical question you may be asked is like, uh, should we pick alpha 0 0.4 or 0 0.3? Then if, in this, if this, you know, if this exact same example asked to you, your answer should be 0 0.3. Uh, so you will not be searching basically all the alphas, you know, like you'll be given options and among those options, you will pick one. Any other questions? Okay. By the way, so can, can you upload this spreadsheet, the one which you just showed into the all modules? This is actually uploaded, but since I now changed it, I'm gonna upload this latest version. You know, because in the original form actually, if you under, look at the module under module two, uh, before exam, uh, you will see that actually this Excel file is there. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove that one and put this one because as you see, I changed it a little bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, you already have the original form, but I'll upload this one too. Thank you. No problem. Any other question? Okay, so the next thing that we will review is a moving average. It's gonna be a very similar concept, but this time a different forecasting method. Um, so moving average basically is computed uh, using the average of certain time intervals 
before the, the time interval that we are computing the forecast for. So, uh, and, and I kind of copied this the slide actually is copied from our earlier deck from lecture three. Um, what you will be given is the number of time intervals that you are gonna use. For example, one question you may be asked, uh, what's the moving average forecast for this time interval um, given that the interval that we use is three or four? And I actually took a question from CCP1. Uh, you were asked actually a similar question and let me make it a little bigger so that we can read. Um, so basically you are given 10 weeks of data. So you can see here, this is the week index, this is the sales. Uh, so basically week one, the sales is like 980. And week two, it is 1040. Okay, so basically each week there are sales. So this is actually very typical to what we did. And the question here is determine on the basis of minimizing the mean square error, whether a three period or a four period simple moving average model gives a better forecast for this problem. And I'll walk you through the Excel, but first let me kind of, um, kind of repeat and then walk you to the end point that we are gonna reach. So basically you are given 10 weeks of data and what it is asking you, whether it's a better idea to use three time periods in moving average or four time periods. So what we will do in kind of high level, we will compute the forecasting using the moving average method, but this time with the three as the uh, past number of weeks to use, and then four as the past number of weeks to use. So we will create two models, two forecasting models. And then we will compute the residuals. And then using mean square error, we will decide whether to use three time period model or four time period model. Okay, so this is kind of the, the high level steps. So basically first step is coming up with the forecast for moving average three. Second is coming up with the moving uh, forecast from uh, moving average four. Uh, compute the residuals, compute the mean square error, and lastly, pick the one that has the minimum mean square error. Okay, so this is very similar, right, to simple exponential smoothing we did, but this time, instead of simple exponential smoothing with different exponential smoothing factors, we are gonna use uh, the parameter for the moving average. So this Excel file is uploaded, and the tabs are different things that I'm covering right now. Okay, so this was the first tab, the exponential smoothing model. Now the second tab has the moving average. Okay, let me make it a little bigger so that it's easier to see. Okay, so this is the actual data. Uh, moving average model basically takes the average of certain number of periods before the time period. So if you look at week four, uh, with the moving average three model, uh, we will take the average of the first three weeks and that's gonna be the forecast. Okay, so this is the forecast for uh, week four. This is the forecast for week five. This is the forecast for week six. So it's just a matter of, you know, like what the parameter here is three weeks, using three weeks. If you are uh, looking at the forecast for week four, basically you need to look at the average of the first three weeks. And then, so this becomes your forecast. Basically what we are saying right now, the actual for week four is 1050, but then the forecast says uh, 1046.7. And as we said before, the difference is the residual or error. Okay, so difference between actual and forecast is the error. And we basically repeat this error computation for all the weeks, as long as we have a forecast. So now we will do the same exact thing, but this time, instead of using the last three time periods or last three weeks, we will use last four weeks. So for example, forecasting for week five is gonna be the average of the first four weeks. And then the forecast for week six is gonna be the average from week two till end of week five, right? Those four weeks. 
So now, basically, from here, you have two forecasting models. One of them uses the last three time periods. The other one uses the last fourth time periods. And we compute, basically, the residuals again, same as before, actual minus forecast, right? That's the error. So now, the only thing that's left, actually, computing the mean square error. Okay? Again, mean square error is like, we're going to look at each term, take a square of that term, and then take average. Okay, so basically it is 3.3 multiplied by 3.3 plus um, minus 110 multiplied by minus 110 plus minus 53.3 multiplied by minus 53.3. So taking a square of each and then summing them. And then here we have uh, seven data points. We will divide by seven to, take, to get the average. Okay, so this is going to be, and again, I use some product. So basically some product over itself gives us the square. So if I, basically, if I multiply this with itself, it's going to be the sum of the squares and then divide by seven. And we do the same thing for moving average form, you know, like with four time intervals and then find the number. And among this, which model is the best? Uh, so the model with the smaller mean square error is the best or is the better one, not best. So then the answer to this question, let's see what was the question. Question is, determine on the basis of minimizing mean square error, whether three period or four period is good. And from this, actually, we find that three period model gives a better error. Better meaning smaller. So then if we need to pick one forecasting model, the one that we are gonna pick is the moving average with three time periods. Okay, so these are the typical type of questions for forecasting and regression. Um, do you guys have any questions? Okay, because the next thing that I'm gonna do, actually, I will start talking about optimization. Um, if you guys don't have any question, then, I mean, if you have questions later, we will have time so we can actually uh, visit these concepts again. Okay, so I'm, okay. The second thing is the optimization modeling. Um, and optimization modeling basically is reading this problem, and you, ha you had similar problems actually in CCP2. Um, so basically reading this problem and converting it to a mathematical form where you state the decision variables, objective function, and constraints. Okay. Um, so objective function is the thing, I mean, decision variable is the thing that you are gonna change, right? You are gonna decide the best values for. Objective function is what you wanna maximize or minimize. And then the constraints are the limitations. Um, but let's kind of go through this question here, written here, and then let's kind of um, go through this uh, right side, which is the answer of the question, like the, what is the decision variable, what's the objective function and constraint. Here, basically, what it is saying, you know, read this problem and then give us the formulation. And formulation is given on the right, basically. So, um, basically, in here, in this problem, it seems like uh, they are producing uh, chips. Like, there are diff three different types of chips. So, this is like a product mix model, basically. It will ask you to determine the optimal product mix. And here, it is chips, but there are many applications, right, in other uh, industries, even when you want to decide what should be your catalog or mix of items that you want to carry in a store, you can use a similar um, method. Here, basically, they have three different types of chips, A, P, A, B. Oh, I didn't use the same, but basically pumpkin, which is, I think, with this one. Uh, there is the chipotle, which is this. And then there is the basement, which is here. Okay. Um, so basically, it seems like there are some limited number of resources. Um, salt, there's a limit, like 1,000 ounces. Maize and herbs. Basically, we have a limitation. So it seems like we cannot use more than 1,000 ounces of salt or 2,000 units of maize or 1,200 units of herbs. So we need to be, this will be determining our constraints. And then it seems like each bag of chips requires certain amount of amount from each of these uh, materials. 
And then, then at the end, there's also some profit that the chips are bringing. So basically, if we sell one unit of basement chips, it's going to bring us $0.4. If we sell Chipotle Adobo chips, then it's going to bring us 0 0.6. And if we sell a bag of pumpkin chips, it's going to bring 0 0.5. So then the question here is like, what should be the optimal um, mix of products that we should manufacture or produce, right? So then here, the decision variable basically is how much to produce. How, how many bags of chips to produce? So then that becomes your decision variable. So basically when you read the problem, the first thing that you should think about, what, what is the thing that I can control, right? What, what is the thing that I can change? For example, you cannot change how many, at least in this problem scope, right? How many ounces of herbs um, chips is um, using, right? Because that's given to you. Or it seems like you cannot change the available ounces of salt that's given to you. But what you can change is like how many bags that you can uh, produce so that you can maximize the profit, right? So basically here, the decision variables are how many bags of chips from each type that you want to produce. And I give them like X underscore. Um, so basically you can give them any names, right? But basically these are decision variables that we are going to, we, we will want the optimization problem to solve for. Then next thing I think easy to find is the, pro, uh, the objective function, right? The profits, uh, unit profits are given, like margins are given. So then the profit becomes um, 0 0.4 multiplied with the number of bags for basement chips plus 0 0.6 dollars multiplied with um, Chipotle uh, chips, number of uh, bags for Chipotle chips and 0 0.5 uh, multiply with the number of puppy chips. So this is your profit basically. And here this uh, um, when there's a profit, right? You maximize the profit. When there's a cost, you minimize the cost. So in this case, this is a maximization problem because we are talking about profit. Then we need to uh, find out what the constraints are. And the constraints are mainly, um, constraints are mainly uh, usage, right? Basically each units of each bags of chips use a certain number of uh, certain units of salt and the total units needs to be less than or equal to 1000 and this is the constraint for it basically one uh, bag of pumpkin uh, chips uses two ounces of salt uh, one bag of chipotle chips uses six ounces of salt and then one bag of um, basement chips uses 1.75 ounces of salt so then if we multiply them with the units of the bags, number of bags of chips, then it will give us the total salt usage. And total salt usage needs to be less than equal to 1,000. And uh, same thing with the, I didn't put the formulation, maybe this is a good exercise for you to go through that, uh, but total maize usage, you know, total herbs, you need to do it in the same manner, basically. You know how many units of each, um, how many units per bag is consumed. Uh, when you multiply them with the decision variable, then you will find the total usage of maize, and that needs to be less than or equal to 2,000. So basically, this is it, right? This for, if for this problem, to answer this problem, um, you need to determine the decision variables, then the objective function, then the constraints, and your answer is gonna be basically typing this up. Uh, any questions on this? And you have actually good examples in your homework as well. I would recommend you, and in your CCP too. I would recommend you kind of go through them, uh, basically reading the problem and converting it to a mathematical model. Okay, if no question, then I will kind of go to the next example. So the first, basically, area that you may expect some question is modeling. The second area is understanding the solution. And one of the things that you guys were asking, and I mentioned at the beginning, you are not going to use, you will not need Excel, SAS, or nothing at all like that, uh, because the answers will be given to you, unless it's a graphical problem. Okay, so basically, you will have an idea actually, but you know, you will have a table like this. 
And I'm going to use actually Excel results. Um, so basically, you will have a table like this, and it will tell you what the optimal solution is. And then you will be asked some questions from there. For example, in this one, mathematical formulation is given. Okay, it seems like this problem, they are trying to maximize some function subject to some availability, like assembly R availability, paint R availability, and inspection R availability. Here, mathematical formulation is given. And then you are also given the sensitivity report. And the first question is the optimal number of regular product produced is, this is like you fill in the blanks, right? You need to fill this. And then the optimal number of super products to produce, again, you need to fill in the blanks. And then the total profit. So here in this question, you are asked to provide three numbers. So the first number, optimal number of regular products to produce, and here you can see actually the decision variables are in the top table always. So um, what I would recommend, uh, maybe type this question and I solve in Excel and look at the table so that you get familiar with the, what table provides you. So the first, in the sensitivity report, the first part of the table gives you actually the optimal solution. So you can see here the final value, the column that has the final value, tells you how many units of regular and how many units of super will be produced. Okay, so basically if I wanna answer the first part of this question, the optimal number of regular products to produce is 291.67. That, that's the answer here. And then the second one, the optimal number of super products to produce is 133.33. And then total profit. So for total profit, we need to make some, comp you know, we need to do some computation. So here the objective function is this, right? Which is 50 multiplied by regular plus 75 multiplied by the super. So what we are gonna do, basically 50 multiplied by the regular, the value of the regular, which is the first um, column here, first row, first column, plus 75 multiplied with the super, which is here. So basically, you are asked here two things, right? One of them is like identify where the optimal solution is. The second one, compute the objective function. And identifying where it is, right? It's just a matter of looking at and typing it. But then objective function will be, you know, for this type of questions, you are gonna need a calculator basically to compute this number because here you are supposed to put one number basically. Uh, does it make sense? Any questions here? Okay, so basically this is the second area in optimization that you may expect some questions. So the first area was modeling, right? Reading the problem and coming up with this mathematical formulation. The second part is looking at the report from Excel and then uh, identifying different values from there and then being able to compute like the objective function or the constraint values. Like for example, one extension that you guys may wanna think is Look at the first constraint, assembly R's constraint. Um, can you identify where the slack, what is the amount of slack? And um, the slack, again, if I remind you, we have a right-hand side value, which is 600, and we have a left-handed value, which is left hand, sorry. We have a right-hand side value, which is 600, and we have a left-hand side value, which needs to be computed, right, using the optimal here, which is like, 1.2 multiplied by 291.67 plus 1.6 multiplied by 133.33. So that's the left-hand side. And the difference between the right-hand side and left-hand side is the slack. So if you subtract actually right-hand side, left-hand side from right-hand side, so right-hand side minus left-hand side, that gives you the slack. But the good thing is, we actually know that Excel report has the slacks already. Or does it hold on? Actually, it doesn't. So you need to still subtract. Okay, here, for example, the constraint right hand side is given, left hand side is given, you need to just subtract them to compute the slack. So basically, one extension that I recommend you kind of look into looking at this report, can you uh, compute the slack for each of these constraints? And again, to repeat, slack is the difference between right-hand side and left-hand side.
any questions? Okay, so basically a couple points for you to kind of um, focus when you are studying. Um, make sure you understand kind of each of these columns, what they mean, right? Um, what is the final value? Final value is the optimal solution. What is the reduced cost? We will start talking about it later. Um, what's the you know, objective coefficient? You can see objective coefficients are here, like 50 and 75, and same numbers here. And then again, a low will increase and decrease. We will talk about them. Um, then uh, here, what is relevant is like the final value for the constraints. So the first part of the table are the decision variables. The second part are the constraints. So for the constraints, uh, you have final value, which shows you the left-hand side. Okay, so basically if you plug in this optimal solution on the, in this constraint, like the first one, right? If you multiply 1.2, with this number, which is the optimal solution for regular, plus 1.6 multiply with the optimal solution of 133, right? If you do that computation, you will actually find this number, which is 563.33. So that becomes the left-hand side for the constraint. And here, right-hand side is 600, which is same here, right? And the difference, 600 minus the final value of the left-hand side gives you the slack. Slack means that what is not used in that constraint, okay? The thing that is not used is called slack. Another concept that uh, I would recommend you kind of think about is the binding constraints. So binding constraint basically is when the slack is zero, which means, for example, if you look at the paint constraint, the left-hand side is 300, right-hand side is 300. So slack is zero, which means that that constraint is a binding constraint. Okay, so when you look at here, basically, make sure that you know how to identify where the optimal solution is. You know how to compute the objective function value at the optimal solution. Uh, you know how to compute the slacks. And then uh, you know how to identify binding constraints, like binding versus non-binding. Okay, so basically when it comes to the optimization solution, these are the things that you, you know, like uh, make sure that you have a good understanding. And again, for your, for example, cheat sheet, if I am preparing, I would, I think, put an example of this table and then basically circle and say that, okay, optimal solution is here, you know, so that you have a, um, a kind of a guideline for yourself. So I think this is a good uh, candidate uh, for the cheat sheet. Like basically this table, if it is given to you, uh, maybe you may need a little bit of um, help from your cheat sheet to find out where everything is. So maybe this is something, I don't know, you know it's up to you what you want to put on the cheat sheet, but this is a good candidate. Any questions? Okay. So uh, the next thing is the graphical interpretation. And I think there was a question, I think Giraj asked a question at the beginning, whether the um, graphs, graphical uh, graphs are gonna be given to you. Yes, it will be given to you. So you will not be asked to you know, graph these things, but you will be asked to kind of more interpret and understand what's happening with the graphs. Okay, so let's read this question. So this question is given, right? There's a formulation here and the question is done which says how many tractors and saws should be produ should be produced to maximize profit and how much profit will be make will be will they make so the question is the, basically the data is given mathematical formulation is given and then the graph is given so and then the question is what is the what is the optimal solution basically what's the x and y right and then how much profit? What's the objective function value at the optimal solution? So basically, um, and these questions are gonna be always two dimensional. So basically you will have at most two decision variables, right? Otherwise, I mean, we cannot show, you know, like three dimensional or four dimensional space. So you are gonna always have two decision variables in these questions. What you need to do is like kind of look at the formulation and then map the constraints and objective function to the lines. 
And I did all the right side. So basically left side is the question and the right side is what I did kind of to answer the question. So, um, so one of the things, for example, how many constraints we have? One, two, three. I hope you guys can see it. It's kind of small. Um, first constraint, maybe I'll read it so that you will know. First constraint is 2x plus y less than or equal to 60. Second constraint is 2x plus 3y less than or equal to 120. And then the last one is x less than or equal to 45. Okay, so what I did here, I looked at each constraint and then kind of, you know, like put an arrow showing which one is which. And in your test, you can do the same thing, basically. So I think for me, the easiest is like the last constraint, which is x less than or equal to 45. It is this line here. Because here, this is the x value, right? The x is here, 45 is here. So this line intersects with the x-axis at 45. So this line, basically, the left-hand side is the feasible region. And then, we will do the same thing for the other constraint. The first one is like 2x plus y less than or equal to 60. I don't know whether you guys um, know how to, uh, you know, like the easy way, right? You can actually find uh, each intersection by just um, saying this is, you know, like uh, making it equal. So when, when we look at this one, 2x plus y less than or equal to 60, if you look to, you know, if you do 2x plus y equal to 60, that is this line basically, right? And then this line is gonna intersect the y-axis at 60 and x-axis at 30. If you have any difficulty identifying, maybe reach out to me. I can send you a couple of maybe uh, uh, tutorials or notes, like short notes or some videos. Basically, uh, I think the prerequisite for this analysis is knowing how to plot lines, two-dimensional lines. And if you feel like you are kind of struggling with that, um, then I can send you some kind of easy to understand videos or you know, notes, and then you guys, you know, that can help you. So the, basically the first step to solving this problem is identifying which line is which, okay? So basically this is the first constraint. This one here is the second constraint. And then this one here, which is the straight line, is the last constraint. And the intersection of these regions is shaded here. Okay, so the shaded array is the feasible region. So basically any point inside this region is a feasible point for this problem. But it is not optimal, not all of them optimal, right? We have one optimal solution here, but lots of feasible points, like for example, I, I don't know whether you see my cursor. My cursor is on x equal to 10 and y equal to zero. That's a feasible point. That's an, you know, like, that doesn't violate any of the restrictions we have. But that's not optimal. So that's not the most profitable uh, solution. So now, after we identify which line is where, um, then the next thing is like finding the optimal solution. And for that, you need to plot the optimal line. And an optimal line here is like 30x plus 30y, right? And depending on your optimal solution, you, I have multiple lines here. And then you pick the line that is highest, but still crosses the feasible region, which becomes this corner. And basically, the corner is the optimal solution. And the corner is the intersection of the first two constraints. So if you intersect this line with this line, um, then that will give you this point, which is x equal to 30 and y equal to 15. The good thing is like in this question, actually, star is already given to you, right? When you see a star, it's optimal solution. An optimal solution in the linear programming, uh, up, in most cases, there are some um, exceptions, is always at the corners. So basically here, if I look at this problem, I know that the optimal solution is either this corner or this corner or this corner or this corner, right? One of those four. And the one that makes the objective maximum is this corner. So then we pick that. 
So here the optimal solution, so to answer, let's look at the question, how many tractors and saws should be produced? So X is the number of tractors and Y is the uh, number of lawn mowers. Um, so the, then uh, tracks, basically the uh, tractors is like 30, lawn mowers is 15. This is the optimal solution. And then the next thing is like computing the optimal, so that objective function value, right? Because it's also asking how much profit will they make? Then it is basically, you take the X, which is 30, multiply by the coefficient of X, which is 30. So 30 multiplied by 30 plus coefficient of Y is 30 multiplied by 15. So it's gonna be 1,350 basically. I think so. I'm not sure. I, I just computed in my mind, but I'm not sure. So basically, let me actually write it here so that you guys. Um, optimal objective function value is um, 30 multiplied by x plus 30 multiplied by y, which is. 30 multiplied by 30 because that's the optimal solution and 30 multiplied by 15 and this needs to be let me see i think this is correct okay does it make sense any questions So this type of questions, you will be basically given this graph and you will um, identify the, where is the optimal solution, what is the objective function value, um, which constraint is binding. For example, this corner, right, you can see that we are, first two constraints are binding. Binding means that it kind of limits, right, kind of, they're at the boundaries. But this constraint is not binding, it's just far away. So basically, when you look at the graph, make sure that you identify where is the optimal solution, uh, where are the constraints, what's the objective function, uh, and which, uh, I don't know whether I said, but which constraints are binding. Any questions? Uh, Dr. C, in this uh, optimal solution seems to be 15 and 30, X and Y. Uh, oh, you are right, definitely, yes. You are saying y is 30, x is 50, yes. That, yep. So let me actually change it here. So the, the value of the profit is not gonna change, but then um, the order, you are right. So here you can see that the um, this is 15, like on the x, and this is 30 on the y. Good catch, thank you. Sure. Uh, any questions? Okay, let's move on. Okay, the last thing, and then we will go through a couple of the examples. Let me see. Um, okay, so I actually put some questions from homework and CCP that are re relevant. Um, as long as we have time, I think we can go through them. If not, you guys can go through them by yourself. But these are basically homework and CCP questions that you guys were working on. But I'll make sure that the questions that are not part of homework or CCP are going to be covered today. Okay, so this is um, the same question actually we had before, but this time um, it's asking uh, more about the sensitivity of the model. So it's basically saying, saying that if downtime reduced the available capacity for painting by 40 hours, profits would be reduced by what the amount. So you need to kind of fill that amount. And I think um, you had a similar question actually in your homework as well about the sensitivity, like changing basically the coefficients or the right-hand side. So this one basically is asking changing um, the right-hand side. So if you look at it, uh, painting basically 300 is the available number of hours for painting, right? The second constraint. Basically, this, constraint, this question is asking, look at the second constraint, and let's assume that the available painting hours is reduced from 300 to 260. So we reduce it by 40. 
then the question is whether the profit is going to change or not. Okay, if it's going to change, then with what, uh, with how much value? Uh, so now, you know, like the, the key point of this example is understanding the sensitivity report. Okay, as you guys remember, we looked at this report, but at that point, we were just looking at the optimal solution. Now we are going to look at the other columns and the columns that we are interested, second columns here, like reduced cost and shadow price, this one. And then the last two columns, allowable increase and decrease. And we will talk about kind of what they, what they mean. So I'll kind of do a summary of these concepts so that um, the rest of the um, you know, discussion is gonna be relevant. So the first thing is reduced cost. Basically reduced cost is the change in the uh, objective function value. If you change the um, objective coefficient. So basically if we start playing with this 50, like up or down, what is gonna be the change in the objective function value? And by, when I say playing with uh, objective function value, I mean like, for example, making 50, like this is profitability, let's say. Let's say that somehow we increase the profitability of the regular product to 51. Would it make our uh, optimal solution better? So reduced cost basically tells us for per unit change in objective coefficient, what will be the change um, in the optimal solution, objective function value of the optimal solution. That's what the reduced cost is. A local increase and decrease tells us the ranges that this, the conclusion from the reduced cost is valid. So a local increase means that 50, we can increase it by 70 and make it 120, or decrease the 50 by 20 and make it 30. So then a lowable range for the objective coefficient becomes 30 to 120. Okay, so basically a lowable increase and decrease gives you an idea about the range of the objective coefficient values that this reduced cost is gonna be valid. So what this tells me, this first row, if the objective coefficient value is increased up to 120 or decreased down to 30, between those values, actually there is not gonna be any change in the objective function value because the reduced cost is zero. And let's compute the same thing for the second uh, decision variable, which is super. Reduced cost for super is zero, which means that the, within the allowable range, if we increase or decrease the objective function coefficient for this product, the change in the objective function of the optimal solution is gonna be zero. And here, a lowable range is here, right? So it tells us that we can increase the coefficient by 50, which is like 125, right? Because if you sum 50 with 75, then it becomes 125. So up to 125 and down to 75 minus 43.75, down to that value between those ranges, reduced cost is zero, which means that if we change the objective coefficient value, there is not gonna be a change in the optimal objective function value. So this is how you interpret the reduced cost and allowable increase and decrease. Okay, now let's look at the constraints. So in the constraints, um, basically we have, instead of reduced cost, we have shadow price or dual price. It is both of them are the same thing. So some people call it shadow price, some people call dual price, but it is the same thing. So we have the concept of shadow price. Uh, again, same as before, shadow price concept valid only within the allowable, in, the allowable range, which are given in the last two columns. And what shadow price is, is very similar to the reduced cost. Shadow price basically tells us if we change the um, right-hand side val value by one, what will be the change in the optimal objective value? Op optimal objective function value. Like for example, let's look at the second one. This is zero, so I I'm gonna look at a positive one. So basically what this says, the second one, the paint, I'm looking at the paint constraint, it seems like the shadow price is 33.33. .33. 
what this says, if I increase the right hand side, which is 300, to 301, then the increase in the optimal objective value um, is gonna be by 33.33. .33. The other side, this is a symmetric concept. So the other side is also true, which is if we decrease it by one and make the right hand side 299, then the optimal objective function value is gonna de decrease by 33.33. .33. So basically, if you do a plus, it's gonna be an increase. If you do a minus, it's gonna be a decrease. So now let's kind of look at the a low goal range. So this 33.33 .33 increase or decrease in the objective function value is only valid within the a low goal ranges. And a low goal range is given here, right? Basically what they say, we can increase this 300 by this much, almost 40. And still this shallow price is gonna be valid. Or we can decrease it up to um, by, you know, like, maximum by 175 and it will be still valid. And if you compute the range basically, it will be um, 300 minus 175, which is 125, right? That is the lower that we can go with right hand side. And then the upper is like 339.229. So let me just write it. So a lowable range or shadow price of painting constraint oh. it's basically 300 minus 175 because that's the maximum decrease 300 plus 39 Okay, so this is the allowable range. And if I kind of translate this right to, from the algebra to a real number, it says 125. If the right hand side decreases down to 125 or up to, increases up to 339.29, then the change per unit change in the objective function value will be 33.33. .33. Okay, so now we understand kind of this is the allowable increase and decrease. Now let's answer the question. So the question is asking if the available capacity for painting uh, decreased by 40, which means that now it is 300, like the maximum available painting hours is 300. If it becomes 260, then what it's asking is like, what would be the new profit? Uh, but actually, it's asking for the profit change. So we need to kind of just compute the delta. So here, it, should, it is explained here, uh, total change in profit. I mean, so you can see, first thing to check is whether this change is within the allowable range. Okay, if it is not within the allowable range, this report you cannot use. Okay, you need to solve the problem again. So basically, if this decrease like 260, decrease to 260 is not within the allowable range, then you need to say, this report doesn't give me the answer, right? I cannot answer this question with this report. If it is within the allowable range, then we can use shadow price. So let's look at the allowable range. It is 125 to 339, and 260, which is the number they're asking us, is in this range. So then it means that we can use shadow price. So shadow price was 33.33. .33. Um, if we reduce the um, right hand side of the paint constraint by 40, then it's just a matter of multiplying the shadow price with the change. And that will tell you the profit change the, in the optimal solution. So the answer of this question, if you compute this number, um, I cannot now compute in my mind, but basically the, this is the answer. Whatever this number is, you need to just type it here. Okay, so basically to summarize, uh, the things that I think you should pay attention is uh, when you look at this, when you are kind of studying, make sure that you understand what is the meaning of reduced cost, what is the meaning of shallow price, 
what is the meaning of a global increase and decrease? And then being able to answer questions like, if you change the capacity, that the right-hand sides, or if you change the objective function coefficient, do you know how to compute the optimal value change or optimal objective function value change? So make sure you have a good grasp of it. So just to repeat again, um, if, you change, if we change the right-hand side, or if we change the objective function coefficients, make sure that you know how to compute the change in the optimal objective value. Okay, so this is kind of sense. So th these are the type of things that you should expect uh, in this area, in the test. Any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna kind of, so um, now, I mean, for the rest, actually, so the areas that we are covering actually now, this first 12 or 11 slides um, gives you a good sense of that. Um, now what I decided to do is like, um, I looked at actually CCP, I looked at uh, the homework and the questions that I got from you, and I picked a couple questions uh, from the homework and CCPs um, to give you more kind of, um, you know, like guidance. Um, so one of the things I think, um, you know, like in, in I think this is homework too, and I think we talked about this a little bit uh, before, like modeling this question. Um, I think this is the first question. So this first question basically, um, the first part was the modeling, and the second part was the sensitivity. And I would actually focus more on the sensitivity, but let me just quickly go through this part. Um, this part actually we already went through in some of our lectures. Um, this is the first, I think, um, the first introduction to optimization lecture, I think I went through this question. So you guys can kind of, if you are interested in the details, then uh, go through that lecture. Because the point of this exercise is that I want to go through the um, sensitivity analysis part. Uh, so in this question, basically, um, it, we have two processes, and each process produces some products. And the products are called ABC. Um, and each of these processes, uh, when, uh, one hour, when one hour is spent on a certain process, um, then certain number of units of A, B, and C are produced. Uh, the question here is finding the um, optimal solution for the number of hours needed to run the processes so that we can fulfill the demand for A, B, and C. And, what we, and also, it costs some money right, to run these processes. Per hour for each process, uh, there's a cost, and we want to minimize this cost. Uh, so I, I think when I read this question actually, the easiest part for me is like first coming up with the decision variables, then coming up with the objective function. Right? The constraints are more complicated. Uh, so let's talk about these two first, and then let's kind of visit the constraints. So here the decision variables is to decide how many hours we want to run each of these processes so that we can fulfill the demand, you know, like the minimum demand for each of these products. So basically, the decision variables I call are like hours one and hours two, and or you can call them x one or x two, you know, whatever, however you want to call them. But it basically represents the number of hours that we want to run each of these processes. And then the objective function, the cost, is how 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 much ever is it cost, you know, for per hour cost for process one multiplied by hour one. And per hour cost for process one is $400. So then the total cost of process one is 400 multiplied by the number of hours in process one, which is here. The second part of the objective function is the cost from the second process. And uh, total cost from the second process is per unit per hour cost from process two multiply with the number of hours from process two. Okay, so then if you sum these two numbers, that gives you the objective function. Okay, so the second part, the constraints. 
So constraints are going to be the minimum demand constraints. So it seems like maybe this company promised the customer uh, they need to ship or they need to produce at least certain number of units from each of these products. For A, they are saying that they need to produce at least 1,000 units. For B, 500. For C, 300 units. So which means that however hours that, you know, how many hours that we are spending, it needs, we need to make sure that we are many, uh, producing enough number of A, B, and C. So one of the parameters given to us is like how many units of A will be produced per hour on each processes. Like for example, for process one, if we spend one hour, it's gonna give us 300 units of A. If we spend two hours, then it's gonna give us 600 units of A, right? Then the total number of unit, total number of unit, total units of A that we are going to get from process one is given here, which is three hundred, multiplied with the number of hours. Then the second thing is uh, how many units of A is going to come from process two. It seems like what is given to us, and it is I think here in these sentences. It basically says if we run process to one R, we will get 100 units of A. So the total number of total units of total number of units of A that we are going to get from process two is 100 multiplied by the number of R's from process two, which becomes this number. And the summation of these two needs to be greater than or equal to 1,000. <coughs> so this is the <coughs> minimum demand constraint. <coughs> for product A, and we need to do the same thing for B and C, and I'm not going to do it in this session, given that we did this before. Um, in, I think, the introduction to optimization, the first lecture, we did this. So you guys can go through that, but it is kind of the same logic. Um, given the number of R's from process one and two, uh, you need to come up with the formulation for total number of units for B, and then your constraint becomes this total number of units of P greater than or equal to 500. And then do the same thing for C. So this is the model. Uh, I think the interesting part here actually is the sensitivity part. So this is the same question, uh, but what I did is actually I kind of typed in Excel and actually um, just to make sure you guys are aware, the Excel file that I shared with you, there's a tab. You know, you guys can see that. So the, the things that I'm showing on the deck is here. So in case you want to look to see how we formulate the problem, it's here. Okay. So basically, um, uh, so basically the example is that, but let's go through kind of the meaning here. So the question that we want to answer is the last part. So basically what it's asking us, if we start increasing the, our processing cost for process two by increments of 0 0.5, how large must this cost increase before the decision variable change? So basically it's asking us actually the allowable range. So it's telling us that we are gonna increase the objective function coefficient, which is the cost for process two. And it is asking us what is the upper bound? What's the maximum increase that it's okay to make uh, to keep the same optimal solution? <coughs> And then, then it is asking what happens when it continues to increase beyond this point, right? So if you look at the, um, and this, we are looking at the process two, and process two is here like the row 10, like around my cursor. So basically process two, it tells us um, the final value for process two, the optimal solution is two, which means that it is suggesting that we should spend two hours of process two. And then the reduced cost is zero. And so this means actually, if we start changing the objective coefficient for the, which is 100 right now, um, within the allowable range, the change in the optimal objective function value is zero. Okay, so basically to answer this question, when we start increasing by 0 0.5, there is not gonna be any change in the objective function value until we reach the maximum allowable increase. So allowable range, and I kind of put it here, 
a local increase is 300 and decreases 100. So which means that current value is 100, maximum increase that we can go up is 300. So the total becomes 400. So basically the maximum value for the objective coefficient value is 400. And then the minimum is whatever the value right now minus the decrease, which becomes zero. So we make, basically it says objective function coefficient between zero to 400. Reduce cost tells us as we increase the objective coefficient value, the objective function value is not gonna change because the reduced cost is zero. And after, z, you know, like when you exceed 400, then at that point, we don't know. We need to solve the problem again. So this is how you answer the second part of the first question in homework two. So basically in this question, it requires you uh, understand two concepts. One of them is reduced cost. The other one is the allowable range. Um, and so they, in test, you will be given, right? In the homework, you created this um, tab you know, by solving the problem. But in the, um, in the test, you'll be given. But this is a potential question to you, basically, in the test. Like, I'm, we may, you know, like, ask um, up to what value of the objective coefficient you can increase so that the objective function value doesn't change. And the answer here is 400. Basically, 100 cost can increase up to 400. It will still not increase the objective function value because the reduced cost which tells us per unit objective coefficient change, the change in the objective function value, um, this is zero basically. Any question? So, okay, so the summary, and I think this is gonna be the last thing on the sensitive redundancies, except there's a CCP2 question that I wanna go over, but in terms of the numbers, this is gonna be the last one. Make sure that when you look at the sensitivity report, you understand what is the reduced cost, what's shadow price, uh, how to use a lowable increase and decrease. As long as you understand, I think you'll, it will be all, you know, like, um, the questions are gonna be from that point. Um, and you can again, what I would recommend, you know, when you look at these questions again, just try to solve it by yourself first, try to answer the question, then maybe listen to the lecture if you are struggling or to check your answer. And that will give you a kind of a good hands-on experience. Okay. Uh, the second uh, question that I wanna go over from homework two is the last question. Yeah, because I think this wasn't very trivial compared to the other modeling questions we made, you know, we did. And I'm not gonna go through the sensitivity analysis or optimal solution, but just the formulation, the model part of it. Um, and I use the SAS code, but this is like the very similar to mathematical formulation. So I use that, uh, but just ignore that this is SAS code, but assume that it's like mathematical formulation. So here basically in this problem, uh, it's saying that we are producing two types of trucks track one and two, uh, but it seems like there are shops that can be used, uh, but then those are like shared resources. So for example, painting shop can be both used by track, type one track or type two track. If we use the painting shop just for type one track, you can produce 100 units per day. If you just use it for type two tracks, then you can produce 700 per day. Um, so basically, if you produce just type one track, but nothing else, you know, then 700, 800, right? So, but then the thing is this shared, right? Basically, you are not gonna just um, produce type one or track one or track two. You, you will most likely produce both of them or manufacture both of them. Then in that case, you need to figure out what are the proportions that you wanna assign um, to track one and track two. So basically what the, the, here the idea is like in the painting shop, 
if you put the painting shop for 100% to track one, it's gonna produce 800 units. If you put it 50% uh, of the time to track one, it's gonna produce 400 units. So it's kind of a linear, you can assume a linear relationship. So the decision variable, you will have a couple of them, right? One of them is gonna be what portion of the painting shop you wanna assign to track one, which is the painting portion one. And what portion of the painting shop that you wanna assign to um, track two? Then it's gonna be the second decision variable. And because this is a portion, like it needs to be between zero and one. So basically it needs to be, the minimum is zero and the maximum is like 100%, which is one basically. And we need to do the same thing for assembly proportions. Like basically assembly shop, we will also assign some proportion to track one and some proportion to track two. And then using that basically, we will uh, find out what should be the number of units produced for track one. And then what will be the number of units that we will produce uh, track two. So these are decision variables. I mean, I found this little bit non-trivial compared to uh, the other examples, because you need to come up with this proportion idea. Um, this is why I wanted to kind of show you guys the answer. And then the profit here becomes, how, however units of track one, how many units of tra track one that you are gonna manufacture, multiply by thousand because each unit of track one brings you like thousand dollar profit. And then number of units of track two multiplied with 1500 because track two brings like $1,500 of profit. So then the objective function becomes maximization of the profit. So now we need to figure out the constraints. So one of the constraints is like um, the proportions needs to be less than equal to one, right? The summation. So we can never assign more than 100% proportion, which means that the painting shop proportion one plus painting shop proportion two needs to be less than equal to one. And then the same concept for the assembly shop. Uh, so the, those are two constraints, like the bottom two. Then we need to also kind of figure out um, the maximum that we can produce. So um, the maximum track one from painting shop uh, will be 800 multiplied by the proportion. Because if we decide that 50% is the way to go for proportions, then we can never produce more than 400 units. So it becomes 400 is basically 800 multiplied with 50%. So basically each of these trucks the track it needs to be based on the proportion. The number of trucks, track one or track two, um, we need to make sure that the, whatever the proportion we assign, if we multiply by the maximum, it's gonna be the upper bound. Okay, so this is kind of how we formulate. Uh, have a look at it. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. And you, you guys can understand, right? We have an upper bound from the painting shop, but we also have an upper bound from the assembly shop because each truck needs to be produced both in the painting shop and assembly shop. Dr. C, uh, this is Puneet. I have tried to solve this problem without even using the proportion. Hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I have constrained the, the day and uh, I have used, I mean, I have, I have kind of solved it differently when you look at my, my solution. How so I think that there could be multiple solutions to this problem, right? It's not just the proportion, there could be something else as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what is your decision variable? So, I mean, you, you're asking for the answer? No, yeah, yeah. What's the decision variable that you used in your um, formulation? Yeah, so what I got is the zero and 700. No, no, decision variable. What is the decision variable? Oh, I mean the variables. So I use the, the number of trucks that we are using every day, so. Okay, no, this is one way you are, I mean, there, I, I'll look at your answer too, but there, yeah, there may be multiple ways to solve this problem, for sure. This is not the only way, but this is one way to solve the problem. How did you um, represent the constraints? 
Yeah, so that is, yeah, so that's what I was saying that. So what I did is that uh, I assume that if we are producing uh, X number of trucks of type one and Y number of truck of uh, type two, then in, in a day we can produce X divided by 800 plus Y divided by, by 700. And that has to be less than or equal to one because uh, we have on, only one day uh, to paint these trucks. Yes. So, yeah, it's actually this similar. Yes, it will give you the same answer. Yeah, I got the same answer, but I, um, my, my answer was a little uh, simpler. I mean, the solution because I didn't use that proportion. No, that makes sense actually. Um, I like actually the way that you put it. So basically what you are saying, so here you can see that I have the, um, you basically did truck one produced divided by 800. Right? Yep, yep. It's, you know, you can look at the first constraint that I have and put the 800, you know, divide both sides with 800. Um, and that becomes the proportion, then down there, you sum the proportion and make it less than equal to one, which is your constraint overall. So you did it kind of at one pass. Yep. Uh, I, I like the way that you, yeah, that may be a better way. Uh, so basically, I think, is it Pnet, by the way? Yep. Uh, yeah, Pnet's way basically is like simpler than this. But instead of defining proportions, he basically um, formulate the proportion itself. Uh, this way, he doesn't need to define extra decision variables. Yeah, there are, there are more than, I mean, in any of these problems, you may have more than one way. Um, and if there is a case like that uh, in the exam, by the way, um, both answer is going to be correct. Of course, if it's multiple choice, you will know which one to pick. There will be some multi multiple choice as well. Um, if you need to type the answer, then if you answer this way or that way, both of them are going to be valid. Okay, so this is kind of the, um, you know, like one modeling uh, question. Um, I'm not sure, I, you may not have this complicated, you know, this is actually a more complicated modeling problem. Um, you know, like basically the ones that you are going to get is going to be reasonable within the time that you have. Any other questions about this question? So I have a I have a question not related to homework, but in general, a, a, a generic question about the pro program the, about the course. Mm -hmm. So uh, now, after doing this, uh, uh, you know, whatever we have studied so far, is there any new chapter are we going to read, or we will be only focusing on the the project? There will be other chapters. Um, oh, there will. Okay. That'll be, yeah, I'll actually, um, I'm going to make the uh, rest of the homeworks and CCPs available. Um, and, but the, the next chapters are going to be kind of different optimization problems. There's going to be a concept around simulation um, that's going to be a little bit new. Um, and I think that will be it. And you can actually look at the syllabus. Syllabus tells you what are the additional topics that we will see. Okay, so, and then the last thing that I want to cover it to the question uh, from the CCP. Uh, so basically, that was a uh, that was a multi choice a question. It it was asking you kind of pick one of these four things um, in terms of what dual price measures. So dual price basically measures per unit increase in the right hand side of the constraint. Um, and most of you guys um, picked actually the first answer, which is the improvement in the value of the optimal solution. Uh, but actually, it may be an improvement or, decre you know, like uh, degre degradation, you know, both ways. So the answer is the change, basically. So, uh, you know, like one of the good things that you may want to add to your cheat sheet is the um, dual price, shadow price, you know, the definition of those. Um, I think that will be useful for the test. I mean, the test question, you are not gonna be asked concepts like this. You're not gonna be questions like this. It's gonna be more like some practical, some numbers that you need to kind of uh, answer. Uh, but still, I think knowing the definitions would be helpful. Um, and by the way, this is, we are gonna only have one exam. There's not gonna be any other exam. 
so this is the only one basically. Uh, for the rest of the, um, you know, like after the exam, basically you will have homework, CCPs, and finalizing your project. That that will be it. So basically, your final is like your project. So this kind of concludes the materials that I'm going to cover today. But I'm happy to kind of answer any questions that you guys may have for exam preparation. It, it, do you guys find anything like unexpected or um, different? Okay. Um, so I'll have my office hour for the day school. Uh, Dr. Adewar will be available um, again every day from four to five. So you guys can also have, you know, you can uh, reach out to her as well or to me, or I can also meet, uh, you know, with appointment, like if you guys are available at a certain time and no other time, um, then I can, we can do a Zoom session if you have any questions. Um, so yeah, let me know. I'll stop recording. Uh, there's a question, a second. So, uh, Dr. C, what, what are your uh, office hours like tomorrow or day after, if we have any questions? Uh, could you repeat again? What are your office hours uh, for the next two or three days? So, like, uh, my, if, you, my, if you have to consult anything. So, my office hours is actually Saturday, uh, which is um, for, for Eastern time, it is from 11 to 1. Uh, but then, if you are not available during that time, we can have a Zoom session other times as well. Like, I can, um, I can see whether I can be available for 10, 15 minutes uh, to answer your question. So basically, if Saturday works, come by. If not, reach out to me and let's kind of set up a time uh, so that we can do a Zoom session. Um, but if none of this works for you, then Dr. Adewar actually is available as well every day uh, from four to five. Uh, so she will be also available. So basically, the exam starts next week. Uh, so until that time, basically, you guys have the, will have the opportunity. Um, or you know, like you can write your questions as well. You know, like basically, sure. um, 